Hello, BookTube. Yesterday, Mark at Book Time with Elvis read you an essay uh, in that wonderful reading reading voice of his. He has a regular feature on his channel where he reads you uh, short works in the common domain. He read a short piece called Confessions of a Book Reviewer by George Orwell. Uh, and he, it was a wonderful thing, I'll leave a link to his video, and he offered very little in the way of commentary except to mention at the end that when he was reading a piece about the life of a, of a book reviewer, he naturally thought of me, <laughs> because I am a book reviewer. Uh, and I, I write for newspapers, and I experience books in the mail, all that sort of stuff. If you've been watching this channel, you, you already know that. I've been doing it for a long time, and before I did it for a long time, I took a long break, but before that long break, I also did it for a long time, so I have a lot of experience doing this. Uh, and I've read this piece many times. It's often anthologized, and it never fails to irritate me. Uh, and it irritated me even so when Mark read it to you. Uh, so I asked him, would it be all right with him if I read it to you as well? And then offered commentary. And he said, fine. <laughs> so I hauled down my collected essays of George Orwell, Volume 4. I'm going to read you the essay, and then we're going to talk about it a bit and <laughs> get this off my chest. Uh, this is Confessions of a Book Reviewer uh, by George Orwell. In a cold but stuffy bed-sitting room, littered with cigarette ends and half-empty cups of tea, a man in a moth-eaten dressing gown sits at a rickety table trying to find room for his typewriter among the piles of dusty papers that surround it. He cannot throw the papers away because the waste paper basket is already overflowing, and besides, somewhere among the unanswered letters and unpaid bills, it is possible that there is a check for two guineas, which he is nearly certain he forgot to pay into the bank. There are also letters with addresses which ought to be entered in his address book. He has lost his address book, and the thought of looking for it, or indeed looking for anything, afflicts him with an acute suicidal impulse. He is a man of 35, but looks 50. He is bald, has varicose veins, and wears spectacles, or would wear them if his only pair were not chronically lost. If things are normal with him, he will be suffering from malnutrition, but if he has recently had a lucky streak, he will be suffering from a hangover. At present, it is half past eleven in the morning, and according to his schedule, he should have started work two hours ago. But even if he had many, made any serious effort to start, he would have been frustrated by the almost continuous ringing of the telephone, the yells of the baby, the rattle of an electric drill out in the street, and the heavy boots of his creditors clumping up and down the stairs. The most recent interruption was the arrival of the second post. Mail used to be delivered more than once a day. Uh, which brought him two circulars and an ink and income tax demand printed in red, meaning well overdue. Needless to say, this person is a writer. <laughs> he might be a poet, or a novelist, or the writer of film scripts, or radio features, for all literary people are very much alike, but let us say he's a book reviewer. Half hidden among the piles of papers is a bulky parcel containing five volumes which his editor has sent with the note suggesting that they, quote, ought to go well together. They arrived four days ago. But for 48 hours, the reviewer was prevented by moral paralysis from opening the parcel. Yesterday, in a resolute moment, he ripped the string off it and found the five volumes to be Palestine at the Crossroads, Scientific Dairy Farming, A Short History of European Democracy, this one is 680 pages and weighs four pounds, Tribal Customs in Portuguese East Africa, and a novel, It's Nicer Lying Down, probably included by mistake. His review, 800 words say, has got to be in by midday tomorrow. The joke here is that the books don't go well together. They're completely dissimilar to each other. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, three of these books deal with subjects of which he is so ignorant that he will have to read at least 50 pages if he is to avoid making some howler which will betray him not merely to the author, who of course knows all about the habits of book reviewers, but even to the general reader. By four in the afternoon, he will have taken the books out of their wrapping paper, but will still be suffering from a nervous inability to open them. Hours have passed. He's just looking at them. Uh, the prospect of having to read them, and even smell the paper, affects him like the prospect of eating cold ground rice pudding flavored with castor oil. And yet, curiously enough, his copy will get in to the office in time. Copy meaning the finished review. Somehow it always does get there in time. At about 9 p.m. his mind will grow relatively clear, and until the small hours he will sit in a room which grows colder and colder, while the cigarette smoke grows thicker and thicker, skipping expertly through one book after another and laying each one down with a final comment, God, what tripe! In the morning, blear-eyed, surly and unshaven, he will gaze for an hour or two at a blank sheet of paper until the menacing figure of the clock frightens him into action. 
Then suddenly he will snap into it. All the stale old phrases, a book that no one should miss, something memorable on every page, of special value other chapters dealing with, etc., etc., will jump into their places like iron filings obeying the magnet, and the review will end up at exactly the right length and with just about three minutes to go. Meanwhile, another wad of ill-assorted, unappetizing books will have arrived by post. So it goes. And yet, with what high hopes this downtrodden, nerve-wracked creature started his career only a few years ago. Do I exaggerate? I ask any regular reviewer, anyone who reviews, say, a minimum of 100 books a year, uh, whether he can deny in honesty that his habits and character are such as I have described. Every writer, in any case, is rather that kind of person, but the prolonged, indiscriminate reviewing of books is a quite exceptionally thankless and irritating and exhausting job. It not only involves praising trash, though it does involve that, as I will show in a moment, but constantly inventing reactions toward books about which no one, one has no spontaneous feelings whatsoever. The reviewer, jaded though he may be, is professionally interested in books. And out of the thousands that appear annually, there are probably 50 or 100 that he would enjoy writing about. If he is a top-notcher in his profession, he may get hold of 10 or 20 of them. More probably he gets hold of two or three. The rest of his work, however conscious he may be, uh, conscientious he may be in praising or damning, is in essence humbug. He is pouring his immortal sp spirit down the drain half a pint at a time. Often quoted from this piece. Uh, the great majority of reviews give an inadequate or misleading account of the book that is dealt with. Since the war, publishers have been less able than before to twist the tales of literary editors and evoke a pain of praise for every book that they produce. But on the other hand, the standards of reviewing have gone down owing to a lack of space and other inconveniences. Seeing the results, people sometimes suggest that the solution lies in getting book reviewing out of the hands of hacks. Books on specialized subjects ought to be dealt with by experts, and on the other hand, a good deal of reviewing, especially of novels, might well be done by amateurs. Nearly every book is capable of arousing passionate feeling. If it is only a passionate dislike, in some or other reader, whose idea about it would surely be worth more than those of a bored professional. But, unfortunately, as every editor knows, that kind of thing is very difficult to organize. In practice, the editor always finds himself reverting to his team of hacks, his regulars, as he calls them. None of this is remediable so long as it is taken for granted that every book deserves to be reviewed. It is almost impossible to mention books in bulk without grossly overpraising the great majority of them. Until one has some kind of professional relationship with books, one does not discover how bad the majority of them are. In much more than nine cases out of ten, the only objectively truthful criticism would be this book is worthless. While the truth about the reviewer's own reaction would probably be, this book does not interest me in any way, and I would not write about it unless I were paid to. The public will not pay to read that kind of thing. Why should they? They want some kind of guide to the books they are asked to read, and they want some kind of evaluation. But as soon as values are mentioned, standards collapse. For if one says, and nearly every reviewer says this kind of thing at least once a week, that King Lear is a good play, and The Four Just Men is a good thriller, what meaning is there in the word good? The best practice, it has always seemed to me, would be to simply ignore the great majority of books and to give very long reviews, 1,000 words as a bare minimum, to the few that seem to matter. Short notes of a line or two on forthcoming books can be useful, but the usual middle-length review of 600 words is bound to be worthless even if the reviewer genuinely wants to write it. Normally, he doesn't want to write it and week-in, week-out production of snippets soon reduces him to the crushed figure in the dressing gown whom I have described at the beginning of this article. However, everyone in this world has someone else he can look down on, and I must say, from experience of both trades, that the book reviewer is better off than the film critic, who cannot even do his work at home, but has to attend trade shows at 11 in the morning, and with one or two notable exceptions, is expected to sell his honor for a glass of inferior sherry. That was done for the New Republic in 1946, and it is pure codswallop. It is yet another example of beautiful prose tending to mask the uh, persistent fact that George Orwell seldom knew what he was talking about. In this case, the problem isn't that he doesn't know what he's talking about, it's that he does know what he's talking about. This book is the collected works of George Orwell, and the collected um, essays and journalism and letters of George Orwell. And the table of contents is, has a pieces like Confessions of a Book Reviewer, 
interspersed with book reviews that are well wrote for 800 words <laughs> indiscriminately uh, on a deadline and they're excellent so you know <laughs> if, if and he's been doing it for a long time by the time we get these pieces he's been doing it for a long time this is volume four in the collective journalism of george orwell so where do these these uh doom and gloom pronouncements come from I don't particularly know, but I know for sure that the figure that he describes in Confessions of a Book Reviewer is a bad book reviewer. Uh, the book reviewer that we see in the example that he gives has had the books that he has to read and review sitting unopened for days. So this, this business about how he's hammering out cl tired old cliches that, that, uh, at the very last minute, with literally three minutes to go, is entirely self-inflicted. Who says every book reviewer is like that? George Orwell? Well, only George Orwell. And George Orwell might have been like that. But a lot of book critics aren't like that. And what's wrong with having a stable of regular reviewers? If they can do good work, would George Orwell call the stable of regular reviewers who are constantly in the New York Review of Books, would he call them hacks? Would he do it to their faces? What about himself writing in the New Republic? What about his, his peers at the time in the 1940s when he was writing these pieces who were writing regularly for the TLS? We call Virginia Woolf a hack. He, it's a classic straw man. He creates an image of a harried hack book reviewer who's bad at his job. He's not even examining the works that he has to review until the very last minute. He's making no effort to research or to care about what he's doing. And he turns in his copy, which is full of cliches. That isn't the way a lot of book reviewers do it. That that sets the terms of Orwell's discussion on in the way that he wants, which is that this is a miserable, miserable profession. And the reason that he does that, the reason he creates that straw man, is because he has this wild utopian idea of what it should be like, where critics review only a handful of books, the ones that seem to matter. Who makes that decision? The critics make that decision. Orwell makes that decision. But book reviews aren't for critics. And they aren't for authors. They're for those readers who he mentions want their books evaluated, want some hint at more than just a sentence of the, the pros and cons of the book they're considering buying. That's who your book review is for. And you don't get to determine what those people find interesting and what they don't. If, in in the, the exaggerated example that Orwell gives, the reviewer could always simply refuse to say that these books go together, right? He could simply not write a piece that tries to link agriculture with a modern novel. He could not. He could refuse to write that. Uh, editors, book section editors, do often make that kind of demand. They will send uh, one of their team of hacks, one of their stable. They will send that person two books. Uh, new biography of Edna St. Vincent Millay and a collection of letters in which some of her letters appear. And they'll say, as a, a famous old New York Review of Books editor said, see if anything can be done with these. Can you, can you do something with these together? Can you make a piece out of these together? Book section editors are always looking to do that because they want to increase the number of books that they include in their sections, but they never have enough space. So a roundup piece is a mirage. It is a beautiful jeweled city on the horizon. They're always dreaming about it. It's very hard to find a reviewer who will do that and who can do it well. Uh, but they are always looking for it, and the publishing industry is always helping them <laughs> to, to do that. There are almost always adjacent books that come out. Uh, I think we saw a few years ago a collection of the nonfiction of the novelist Robert Stone came out at the same time as a new biography of Robert Stone. Any book editor in the world is going to see those two and think, I'm not going to review these separately. I'm going to find someone who will review these together, and I'm going to put them both in the indicia at the top of the review. To increase the number of things I cover, I will do that. But the examples that Orwell gives in his straw man are ridiculous. No editor in the world would expect those things to go together. It's just designed to set up his ideal solution. But I don't like his ideal solution. George Orwell might be outing himself here as a relatively poor reviewer, although his reviews read wonderfully. He was a snob. Anyone who thinks there are, that there are only a handful of books, what was it, 30 a year? 30 to 100 a year that matter, that seem to matter. Anyone who thinks that is a snob. Uh, there are plenty of books that seem to matter. All you have to do is dispense with the re that ridiculous word game about how the latest thriller and King Lear, if, if you call both of them good, then what does good mean anymore? <laughs> George Orwell was not a child. 
he knew perfectly well what good means. It means they're good examples of the separate things they are. It doesn't mean that the, that the good is being used as a sort of plaster Paris equating of the two. That's not how it was used. That's not how anybody uses it, and he knows that. So the point that I want to make, that I always want to make about Confessions of a Book Reviewer, is that it's mostly rhetorical. It's mostly a rhetorical exercise in winning a point. You have to watch for that in Orwell. It's everywhere, in his fiction and his nonfiction. It doesn't lessen his worth as a writer. He's a terrific writer. But you have to watch for whether or not he's playing a game with you. Uh, whether or not he's trying to coerce an opinion out of you, form an opinion out of you based on setting the table and rigging the game. And he is in this Confessions of a Book Reviewer. Good Lord. I feel certain that at, at this point in his life, when he wrote this in 1946, I feel certain that at the point when he wrote that book, that essay, Confessions of a Book Reviewer, and the point where I'm at my life now, I feel certain that I have known more book reviewers than he did when he wrote that. And he's just wrong. <laughs> he was wrong then, and he's wrong now. So I wanted to utter a refutation of Confessions of a Bookseller. If I write such a piece myself, if the New Republic wants me to, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> If I write such a piece myself like that, I might tongue-in-cheek point to some of the flaws of regular book reviewers, but I won't make up a dystopia specifically in order to explode it. And if I offer a solution, it won't be that, that, you know, we want to review only the right kind of book. No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. So that's what you can do with your confessions of a book reviewer. <laughs> but I promise not to respond to everything that Mark reads to you. I just couldn't let this one go. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up for now. But I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.